All right. Good morning, everyone. Stop talking about sports for a little while. <clears throat> so hopefully everybody had a good weekend. Got some recovery after a long week. So uh, let me first start off by reminding you of the things that we have done. So uh, Friday, we mostly talked about uh, defining new things for our kinematics. So again, kinematics is the prediction of how an object is going to move given certain initial conditions. Right? So, and this thing depends on four quantities, as we talked about, that's going to be position, or actually more importantly, displacement. And it also depends on velocity, acceleration, and time. So again, position, as we define position. So position, again, is the location of an object relative to some sort of origin, where, again, it's going to be some sort of observer uh, at any given moment of time. So just to point out, as we talked about yesterday, or sorry, Friday, uh, this happens to be a vectorial quantity. So for a vector, in this case, it's going to be a vector which points from the origin to the location of that object at a given moment of time. So for example, if my object is sitting here, use my, there we go. So if it's sitting here at T1, so that this is X T1, then my vector then is gonna point from the origin to its location at X1. Displacement then is the difference between the final initial positions. This is also a vector. This one is a little bit slightly different where this vector points actually from the initial position to the final position, not from the origin to its location. So here, if people all signed in. So for example, if my object starts off here at X1 and then moves to the left in this case, goes to X2, our displacement then is going to be the vector which points from the position of x1 to the final location of x2 and the magnitude of that will be the distance at which it actually traveled. So in this case, remember vectors has to have, for us, since this is one dimensional motion, two pieces of information has to have a magnitude, which is the overall distance and a direction. So in this case, it moved say two meters to the left. So formally our Displacement is defined as the final location minus the initial location, or in this case, x of t2 minus x of t1, which I'm going to define as just x2 minus x1. So this is our displacement. Now, again, since this is a vector, technically, the way I should write this is with actually a vector sign. So there should actually be a little arrow over top of these things, since these guys are vectors. Now, again, since we're only working one dimension, we're not going to worry too much about that vector sign. But once we get into multiple dimensions, we will care about all those different vector signs. But again, all of these should technically have vector signs on them. But again, since we're working in one dimension, we can just simply say the distance and to the right, distance and to the left, or east, west, things like that. So, But once we start getting into multiple dimensions, we'll have to take into account more information than that. Uh, we also talk about distance. So again, distance is simply the total amount at which an object has undergone. So if I moved it from again the origin to x1 back to x2, then the total distance then is going to be the distance it went originally from the origin to x1, which uh, let's say that's uh, five meters back in this case two meters, so it has gone a total of seven meters in this case, for example. Now this guy is not a vector. This guy is a scalar quantity since it doesn't depend on the direction and only depends on the total amount. Uh, the final two things we talked about last time were average velocity. So this is the rate of change of position over some sort of macroscopic time scale. So here we define that the average velocity is equal to the displacement divided by the change in time, which is x2 minus x1 divided by t2 minus t1. Now, one thing to point out here is since time always proceeds forward, delta t is always going to be positive, which means that the average velocity will always point in the same direction as the displacement. So if it has moved to the right, that means that the velocity will also point to the right. Okay, so it's going to point in exactly the same direction. Now, again, since this thing is technically a vector, we should again put vector signs on all these things. So vector, vector, vector. But again, time is a scalar quantity. Finally, the last thing is the instantaneous velocity. This is the moment to moment velocity. So this is how fast you're going from moment to moment to moment. Uh, this guy, again with a vector sign, is defined as the limit as delta t goes to zero of the average velocity, which is equal to the limit as delta t goes to zero of the displacement divided by the change of time, 
which we now know is equal to the derivative of the position with respect to time, which is the tangent line to a curve. So again, if I plot in x versus t here, so if this is t, this is x, and I had some sort of graph on here, again, let's draw something like that, then the instantaneous velocity at any moment, say at this point, at this time, is simply the tangent line which touches this curve at that particular point. So the instantaneous velocity then is the slope of this tangent line. So that's how fast we're going at this particular moment. Good. So uh, last time we finished off in an example, let's do another example. So this one says we have an electron which moves along the x-axis, has a position which is given by x of t is equal to 16 times t e to the minus t in meters, where t is actually given in seconds. It wants to know how far is the electron from the origin when it momentarily stops. So let's talk about why this thing actually stops, first of all. So again, we have an electron. So we know x is equal to 16 t e to the minus t. So why does this thing actually stop? So let's make a plot of this. And we also want to know how far away is it when it stops and how long does it take for this thing to stop. So this is x and this is t. So why does this thing actually stop? Well, for small times, it turns out that for small times, so for example, when t is much, much less than one second, the exponential is approximately equal to one, which means that this thing is actually increasing as just linear in t. So this thing goes as effectively 16 t. So for small times, this thing is just going to linearly increase something like this. Okay. Now for large t, so for t much, much bigger than one second, t here blows up, this thing is gonna to go to infinity, but e to the minus t is actually going to go to zero. And it turns out that the exponential actually goes to zero faster than this guy blows up to infinity. Okay. Which means that for large t, this thing is actually going to exponentially decrease. So this thing is gonna actually do something like this. So if I add these two plots together, my overall plot then is going to basically do something like this. It's going to increase, turn around, and then come back down. So this is what the plot is going to look like. So this is the plot of the position versus time of this particular electron moving up along the x-axis. So what happens is this thing starts off at the origin at time is equal to zero, and then it's going to go until it reaches its maximum distance, where this is going to be the maximum distance. It's going to be x max. And that's going to occur at some time of t max. At that point, it's going to turn around and then start moving back towards the origin and then asymptotically approach the origin. So <clears throat> now what's happening here is let's think about the velocity. So again, what we know is that the velocity is the slope of the tangent line on this curve. Right? So what's happening here is anywhere on this side, if I draw a tangent line across this plot, my velocity has a positive velocity. But anywhere on this side, my velocity is negative because it has a negative slope, which means that this thing starts off with a positive velocity, slows down until it ends up with zero velocity, which happens exactly at this point. And then the velocity is going to become negative as it approaches back to the origin. Okay. So since it starts off with a positive velocity, ends with a negative in velocity, there has to be an inflection point. So if I want to know where this thing reaches its maximum distance, well, from calculus, what we know is we have to extremize our function. So in calculus, for those of you who had Calc 1, Calc 2, or Calc 3 at the stage, how do you extremize a function? If you haven't had calculus yet, you don't have to answer this question. <laughs> but for the rest of you, how do you extremize a function? Find the derivative. Good. You find a derivative. And then what do you do with the derivative? Equal to zero. Set it equal to zero. Good. And then you solve for that object that you're taking the derivative in respect to. And then that'll be the time at which it extremizes in this case. Right? So for any function, if you want to extremize a function, what you do is you take the derivative of that function with respect to the object at which it is that you want to extremize. In this case, it's going to be the time. We want to find t max. Once we know what t max is, we plug that back into our original function, which in this case is x, which then finds the corresponding x value. Good job. That was Brooke and Maria, I think. 
both combine together. Good. So in this case, we want to take the derivative of the position with respect to time, but we know that's simply equal to the velocity. So in this case, what we're doing is we're setting the velocity, which happens to be at this point, equal to zero, which means the slope of our derivative, which in this case is the velocity, has to be set equal to zero. So let's go ahead and do that. So what I want to do is take the derivative of this guy. Now what this is, is a product of two functions. So to take a derivative, I have to take the derivative of the first function times the second function plus the first function times the derivative of the second function. Right. So just to remind ourselves, if I have a derivative, in this case with respect to time, of two functions a, b, which both depend on time, then this is equivalent to the derivative of the first function times the second function plus the first function times the derivative of the second function. So for us, the first function is 16t. So if I take a derivative of that, that's then just equal to 16. So e to the minus t plus the first function, which is 16t times the derivative of the second function. Second function is a exponential. So that becomes an e to the minus t with a negative sign. So the derivative of an exponential, I'll write it this way, is then equal to the exponent times e to the at. So the only thing that happens with a Exponential is you get the exponential back, but then that exponent, which is in front of the object you're taking a derivative with respect to, comes down out front. So in this case, that's just a negative one. Okay. So good. I have an exponential here. I have an exponential here. So let's go ahead and factor those out. So this becomes 16 e to the minus t times t minus one. Okay. So this is my derivative. Now, as Maria said, what we're gonna do now is take this guy, set it equal to zero and solve for t. Now, there's two places where this thing can go to zero. Either when this first term here goes to zero or when the term in parentheses goes to zero. Right? These are two different times when this derivative is going to go to zero. So either when the exponential is gonna to go to zero or when the parentheses here is going to go to zero. Now the exponential is only gonna to go to zero when time goes off to infinity. It's valid, but we can see here that this happens at a finite time, not infinity. Okay. So even though we can set this guy equal to zero, we're going to go ahead and ignore this term. So the only thing I care about is when this is going to go to zero. Well, this goes to zero when t is simply equal to one. So this means then that this thing has its maximum time t max at one second. So that means that the distance x max is then going to be equal to, now we're just going to take that t max, plug it back into our original function. So it's going to become 16 t max times e to the minus t max. So it's going to be equal to one second. So this is going to be simply 16 divided by e. Okay. It's okay, because I get 16 times one e to the minus one. So that's 16 divided by e. Plug in my numbers. What I find in this case then is, uh, that this corresponds to 5.89 meters. Eight to nine meters. So the maximum distance that my electron makes it away from the origin by the time it stops is an x max, which is 5.89 meters. Everybody's okay? We'll do a lot of extremizations of functions in this semester. So. Yeah, just remember, anytime you want to extremize a function, you have to take its derivative with respect to the object at which it is you want to extremize. Set that equal to zero. Solve for the object you want to extremize. Plug that back into the original function to then find its extremum. Okay. So, like I said, we'll do that a lot throughout the semester. So, it was okay. Not too bad. Not too bad. So good. So the next topic to talk about is, well, if the velocity changes from one moment to another moment, that means the object has then accelerated. So let's talk about average acceleration. So just like if the position changes with respect to time, that gives us velocity, the average acceleration then is the change in velocity with respect to time. So this is what we call the acceleration. So by definition then, what that means is that the average acceleration then is equal to my change in velocity 
divided by my change in time. So in this case, this is gonna be equal to velocity at T2 minus the velocity at T1 divided by T2 minus T1, or in shorthand notation, I'm just gonna write this as V2 minus V1 divided by T2 minus T1. So this is what we call the average acceleration. Now, again, this velocity here, pay attention to the fact that this is the instantaneous velocity, not the average velocity. So each one of these two velocities is the instantaneous velocity. So this is how the instantaneous velocity is changing from moment to moment to moment. So if it changes, then my acceleration is given by my change in velocity divided by my change in time. Now let's talk about the units of this. So we know velocity has units of meters per second. So this thing has units of meters per second per second. So a meter per second per second is the same thing as a meter per second squared. So this is my units of an acceleration. So acceleration has units of meters per second squared or a meter per second per second. Now, what can happen, of course, is that the average acceleration means that just like the average velocity is it doesn't take the fluctuations of how that velocity is changing from moment to moment. So again, all it's saying is that if I start off here and I end here and my velocity is different here than what it was here over some sort of macroscopic time, then my average acceleration is that amongst that time. Now, but again, if we're driving on the Lloyd and I'm speeding up and slowing down, 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 my average acceleration is not the same as my acceleration from moment to moment to moment to moment. So this means that we can also have an instantaneous acceleration. So let's talk about the instantaneous acceleration. So again, just like the average velocity, the average acceleration is a gross over or underestimation of the actual acceleration over a long period of time where the instantaneous acceleration is what it's doing from moment to moment to moment. So the instantaneous acceleration, I'm just gonna call that A, just like the velocity is then equal to the limit as delta T goes to zero of the average acceleration, which is then equal to the limit as delta T goes to zero of the change in velocity divided by the change in time. Now, as we talked about, whenever I take a limit of a change divided by a change, that's the same thing as the derivative. So this is then the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. But we also know by definition, the velocity is equal to the derivative of the position with respect to time. So I could also rewrite this then as the derivative of the derivative of the position with respect to time. This is what we call a second derivative. So this is also equivalent to the second derivative of position with respect to time. <clears throat> now, this thing also has units of meters per second. Okay. So, an instantaneous acceleration is the rate of change with velocity with respect to time, or the second rate of change of position with respect to time. Now, one thing to point out with velocity and acceleration. So as I said before, velocity always points in the same direction as displacements. But acceleration doesn't have to change or doesn't have to point in the same direction as the instantaneous velocity. So what do I mean by that? So what I mean by that is let's say I'm driving in a car. So here's my car. Here's my beautiful car. And let's say initially I'm moving in this direction with a velocity of v1. Now at a later time, let's say I'm now here. And now I'm moving with a new velocity, let's say v2. Right. Now let's think about what's happening. Let's say in the fact, in the case, if v2 is greater than v1, so if v2 is greater than v1, what happens then is that this object sped up, right? So my change in velocity in that case will be pointing from the low one to the small one, which means in this case, my acceleration is going to be pointing in the same direction as the instant instantaneous velocity. So if 
V2 is greater than V1. That means that this thing has sped up. So in that case, my acceleration is in the same direction as the velocity. But if V2 is less than V1, what that means then is that's what? Let's go back to our acceleration. So if I look at the average acceleration, this means that V2 minus V1 divided by delta T, well, if V2 is less than V1, this thing is negative, which means that the acceleration actually points in the opposite direction as the instantaneous velocity. Right. So <clears throat> when it comes to acceleration, we have to be a little bit more careful than we have to be with velocity. So velocity will always point in the same direction as my displacement. So by moving in this direction, my velocity will always be in this direction, always. When it comes to the acceleration, if I'm moving in this direction and I'm speeding up, then my acceleration will be in the same direction as my velocity. But if I'm moving this way and I'm slowing down, my acceleration then will be in the opposite direction in which it is that I'm moving. Right. Now, both of these two are called, semantically wise, acceleration. In physics, we don't make a difference between acceleration and deceleration. They're both just acceleration. So even though this one is speeding up, and in the English language, we would call this decelerating. But in physics, we don't call it decelerating. We just say the acceleration is in the opposite direction. Right? So it's still accelerating, but it's in the opposite direction. So it's slowing it down. Right? So again, even though English language, we would call it this. But physics-wise, both of these are simply accelerating. So we just have to pay attention to the direction of the acceleration with respect to the velocity. So the acceleration is in the same direction as the velocity. It's speeding up. So this one is speeding up. But if it's in the opposite direction, as in this case, it is slowing down. So think about this one is if you're at a traffic light and you're stopped, the light turns green, everybody becomes a NASCAR driver and you have to accelerate as fast as possible to beat the guy next to you. That's this case. When you see it turn red, if you're driving towards the light, turn, it turns yellow, turns red, you then have to slam on your brakes. That's in this case where it's slowing down, your acceleration is in the opposite direction in which it is that you're traveling. So this is acceleration. So let's use this and let's do an example. So not that one, number four. So this one has the position of a particle moving along the x-axis depends on time according to this equation. So I have x is equal to c times t squared minus b times t cubed, where x is in meters and t is in seconds. So the first thing we want to do is determine what are the units of c and b. So let's do that first. So let's go ahead and do that. Good. So I'm given that we have x is equal to c t squared minus b t cubed. So what I want to know first off is for part a, what are the units of c and b? So what are my units? So this is a good dimensional analysis question that we asked last week. So good. So let's start off with c. What have to be the units of c? So let's use our dimensional analysis. What has to be the units of the left-hand side? So x has units of what? Meters. Meters, good. So that means C then has to have units of what? So if the left-hand side has units of meters, this has units of something times T squared, what has to be the units then of C? Meters per T squared. Oh, so meters per second squared, that's right. Good job, Teddy. So this has to have units of meters per second squared. So C here is actually an acceleration. So this guy is actually an acceleration. So what about B? What have to be the units of B? So again, if the left-hand side has units of meters, this has the units of seconds cubed. So this has to have units of what to make sure that this is in meters? Meters per second cubed. Good, good job, Teddy. So meters per second cubed. So this guy is something we're not actually gonna talk about in this class, but this is what's called jerk. 
not Jamaican jerk. It's not hot. Doesn't taste good. This is a different kind of jerk. So jerk in physics is actually the rate of change of acceleration. This is what's actually called jerk. What I just do. Go away. <laughs> Good. So that's part A. So part B then says, so now I'm going to tell you that these have numerical units of three and two. So that means C is actually three meters per second squared and B is actually two meters per second cubed. Um, Oh, that was B and C, or A and B together. Sorry about that. Okay, so C then says, at what time does the particle reach its maximum position? Good, so let's talk about that part. So, okay. so that was A and this part is actually B. Good. So now it wants to know, when does this thing reach its maximum position? So why does this thing make a maximum position? So let's first start off and plot this guy. Let's do it this way. So again, if I put in my numbers, this is actually equal to three times t squared minus two times b, or sorry, times t cubed. Good. So let's plot this thing. So three t squared is gonna do something like, let's see, it's green. T squared does something kind of like this, right? So this is roughly three t squared. T cubed, what happens with a T cubed is what? Since for small t's, this thing is gonna increase but slower, but then for large t's, this thing is going to increase faster than this one is actually gonna increase. So what's gonna happen then is that for what, large t's, this thing is actually going to, again, start increasing but more slowly and then start increasing faster on this side. So this is roughly negative two T cubed. So if I plot these two things on top of each other, what's gonna happen is for small t's, the t squared is gonna become dominant, but then for large t's, this one is gonna become dominant, right? This one's gonna blow up faster than this one is going to be. So ultimately what this thing is gonna do is it's gonna follow the green curve initially, but then start to roll over and then basically do this. Okay? So for small t's, the t squared is greater than the t cubed. So for small t, so for t much, much less than one, t squared is greater than t cubed, but then for large t, so for t much, much greater than one, t cubed is then greater than t squared. So again, this thing is gonna first initially follow the t squared and then roll over and then start to follow then the t cubed. So that means then that's what, this thing is going to reach its maximum distance. So this is x of t. So this is gonna become x max at some time here, which is gonna be T max. Mm -hmm. Good. So that's why this thing is gonna reach some sort of maximum. So what I wanna know then is at what time does this thing reach its maximum position? Now, we just talked about what that means is I wanna extremize this function. I wanna extremize X with respect to T. So again, I have to take a derivative of X with respect to T. And again, as Maria told us, we have to set this guy equal to zero to find then T. <clears throat> now for here, instead of putting in the three and the two, I'm gonna work with C and B because I like letters better than numbers. But I'm gonna take a derivative first of this first term. So that's gonna become a two C times T minus three B times T squared. That's okay. Now I'm gonna go ahead and factor out the T. So this becomes two C minus three B T all times T is equal to zero. So I'm just factoring out the T. Now, just like we talked about before, what this means is that this thing is equal to zero twice, meaning when this thing, the parentheses is equal to zero or when the T is equal to zero. Okay. That's when this thing is actually equal to zero. Now for us, the T is equal to zero only tells us this initial point, which is when this thing actually starts, which isn't the maximum distance that this thing is gonna make it. So even though that's a valid solution, we're gonna ignore it. We want to say this thing reaches zero when the parentheses equals zero. So this means then we want that 2c is equal to 3bt max. This is the maximum time. Okay. Solve this guy and then for t max. So this then says that t max is then going to be equal to what? 2c divided by 3b. Plug in my numbers, this becomes then what? Two times three divided by three times two, which is simply equal to one second. 
So this thing reaches its maximum distance away from the origin at the time of one second. So this is part C. Or yeah, part C. Okay. <clears throat> Everyone's okay? Not too bad. Now the next part says from time zero to four seconds, what distance does the particle move and what is its displacement? All right, so good. So what we wanna know is what is the total distance that this thing moves and then what is its displacement from zero to four seconds? All right, so how would we do that? Well, to do this, we have to basically split this up into two different parts. Okay. So from zero to four seconds, what happens is, according to our plot here, this thing is going to move away, reach some maximum distance at one second. And then from one second, it's going to then move from that maximum distance all the way down to wherever it ends up at four seconds. Okay. So to find a total distance, what we care about is the distance from zero to x max, and then from x max to the final location, and then add those two distances together, that's going to be the total distance. For the displacement, since this thing starts off at zero, goes up to x max, turns around, comes back to zero, and then continues down from here, then what that means is this total distance here is going to be our displacement. So wherever this thing finishes, say at time is equal to zero down here, so let me write that in green. So if this is our four seconds at this point, so if this is four seconds, then this total distance across here is going to be the displacement, where the total distance then is going to be that displacement plus twice of this distance here. Okay. That's okay. So basically, all this says then is what? If I want to know the displacement, all I have to do is find where it is at four seconds and then subtract where that is at zero seconds. That's the total then displacement. But if I want to know the total distance, I first have to find the distance it traveled from zero to one second, and then the distance from one second down to four seconds, add those two distances together, that's going to be the total distance. Is everyone okay with this? I hope so. <laughs> so let's do that. Uh, let's do the displacement first. So our displacement is then going to be equal to what? X at T four seconds minus then x at t zero seconds. So this is gonna be equal to what? C times four squared minus B times four cubed minus C at zero plus B at zero. Of course, this term and this term are both zero. Even if this is squared and cubed, it's still zero. So this is now going to be what? C times 16, right? Minus B times, uh, let's see, 16 times four, that's 24. So that's what, 64? If I could do bad math in my head, good. So this is gonna be then, what? Um, make sure I get my numbers right. So C was three, good. So it's gonna be three times 16 minus two times 64. Okay. Look at my numbers. What I find in this case then is that the displacement is then equal to minus 80 meters. Good, so this is my displacement. My total distance then is going to be equal to what? So in this case, it's going to be equal to x at t max plus the absolute value of x t max. Let's do it this way. Uh, x. Doo -doo -doo. So this is going to be x at four seconds minus x t max. Okay, so again, we know T max is simply equal to one. So it's gonna be C times one uh, squared minus B times one squared plus the absolute value of, so this is gonna be 
do, 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 using this guy. So it's going to be minus 80 uh, plus, actually, I want to add some value. That's fine. Uh, C times 1 squared minus B times 1 squared. Okay. So plugging my numbers, what I find in this case then is that this thing works out to be, of course, I didn't write it down. So it's going to be, what is this guy? So it's going to be three. So that's only one. So it's going to be equal to 82 meters. There we go. So that's my total distance. <clears throat> is okay? I got a question. Sure. Where did so you have the top equation that says d equals x times t max. Mm -hmm. Where'd you get the b from the equation under that? My, where'd you get that? Oh, so I'm just writing out what x was. So remember, x is c times t squared minus b times t cubed. Oh, OK. <laughs> so all I'm doing there for that is I'm writing then this is c times t max, which is 1, uh, minus b times t max, which is 1. OK, thank but you. You're welcome. Yeah, so all this here is actually just t, x of t max. Yeah, which it turns out x of t max is just one. Because it's going to be three times one minus two times one, which is one. It's so. okay. And finally, last part of the problem says, what is its velocity and acceleration at times? One second, two seconds, and three seconds. Good. So this is what part D. So let's talk about part D. So now we want to know what is the velocity? Well, again, we know the velocity is equal to the first derivative of the position. So as we already took the derivative, this is going to be equal to what? 2 times C times T minus 3 times B times T squared. And then we know the acceleration now is equal to the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. So I take the derivative of this. So that's going to be 2 times c minus 6 times b times t. So this is my velocity at any time, and this is my acceleration at any time. So for the rest of the problem, all I have to do then is plug into different times at which it is that I'm interested in. So here, I want to know what is it at 1 second, 2 seconds, and 3 seconds. So for the first part, I want to know what is the velocity at 1 second? What's the acceleration at 1 second? So my velocity at 1 second is then equal to 2 times c times 1 minus 3 times b times 1 squared. So it's going to be equal to 6 minus 6, which is equal to 0, right? Which we already knew that because 1 second is actually t max. So that's when it has 0 velocity anyways. What's the acceleration? So the acceleration then, a of 1, is going to be what? 2 times 3, which is 6, minus then six times two times one, which is then equal to what? Negative six meters per second squared. Mm -hmm. Everybody's okay? Good. Okay. Oops, wrong direction. So now we just do it again. So we know the velocity at two seconds then is going to be, let's use our expression. So it's two C times T. So I get 2c times 2 minus 3b times t squared. So I get 3b times 2 squared. And my acceleration, I'll write that out too, is then going to be 2 times c minus 6 times b times 2. So let's do this one first. So this is then 6, so that's 12, minus 12 times 4, that's 48. So it's going to be equal to minus 36 meters per second. And my acceleration then is going to be 6 minus, um, so that's a 2, so 12. And that's going to be 24. So that's then equal to minus 18 meters per second squared. And then finally, 3 seconds is then going to be equal to uh, so let's write this out. 2 times c times 3 minus 3 times b times t or 3 squared. And then the acceleration at 3 seconds is going to be 6 minus 12 times 3. Oops. Good. So. Doo -doo. 
Good. So this works out to be, if I did my math right, minus 72 meters per second. And then this one works out to be minus 30 meters per second squared. Doing okay. Not too bad, right? Good. How's everyone doing? Doing okay? So <clears throat> these are the quantities that we need. So now that we understand these different quantities, what we can finally start doing is writing down what are known as the kinematic equations. Okay. So again. We understand now what position is, what displacement is, what velocity is, and what acceleration is. So now using those four quantities, as well as time, we can now start writing down what are known as the kinematic equations. Now, before we write down the kinematic equations, there are some caveats to the kinematic equation. And there's a very big caveat, actually. The very big caveat is that the kinematic equations only work when the acceleration is equal to a constant. If the acceleration is non-constant, that means everything we're gonna do does not work. Doesn't work. Now, how do you get around that? So if the acceleration is non-constant, there's two ways to get around that. One, you have to know the functional form of the acceleration, which means that you have to know the acceleration goes something like t cubed or t to the fourth or one over t, something like that. You have to know the time dependent functional form of the acceleration and then do an integral. Or you have to use something else, which is called conservation of energy, which we're going to get to later in the semester. Okay. That's another way we can get around the fact that we don't know the acceleration. So good. So let's get to the kinematic equations. So, so again, here we have a big caveat. So let's write this big. So here, for this to be true, the acceleration must be equal to a constant. If this is not true, then these equations do not work. So the kinematic equations are what we want. These are going to be the equations that allow us to predict what an object is going to do at any moment of time, any position in space, given we know the initial position, we know the initial time, we know the initial velocity, and we know its acceleration. So these are all the things that we're gonna to have to need to know. Okay. So uh, let me write some notation here. So first of all, I'm gonna write x sub zero as being equal to x of time zero, right? where t zero is equal to the initial time. So t zero is just gonna be our initial time. <clears throat> uh, v sub zero then is gonna be equal to v of t zero. So just meaning that this is also equal to the initial velocity. So this is our initial position. And this is going to be our initial time. Or sorry, initial velocity. Now, again, this velocity here is the instantaneous velocity. At the initial time. Not the average velocity, but the instantaneous velocity. So good. So let's start writing down the kinematic equation. So where the kinematic equations come from are, we're going to start off with our definition of acceleration. So we know acceleration is equal to the time rate of change of the velocity. Okay. Now, <clears throat> to find the velocity, what we're going to do is we're going to use a trick which is called separation of variables. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take both sides here and I'm going to multiply by dt. Okay. So what's going to happen here is the left-hand side then it's going to become a times dt, and then that's going to be equal to dv divided by dt times dt. Now, this dt here cancels this dt here. So now what I'm left with is dv is equal to a dt. So what this means is that my differential change in velocity going from one point to another point is then equivalent to the acceleration times the differential change in time. Okay? So what does that mean? So that means if this is my velocity, means whatever velocity I had here, and then the velocity I have here is different by only an amount of 
this differential amount of velocity. Okay, so dv. So this little section here is what's called dv. So if I want to know the difference between the velocity here, which say is my initial velocity, to whatever velocity I have here, all I then have to do is use this to calculate the differential change in velocity going from point to point to point to point to point to point, and then simply sum them all together. Then my total change in velocity going from this point to this point is simply the sum of all of these different changes. Mathematically, what that means is we integrate. So I'm going to integrate the left-hand side and integrate the right-hand side. So whenever you sum over a whole bunch of different small sections, over some vast quantity, what that means is you're going to integrate. You're going to sum all those guys together. So left-hand side, I'm going to, to integrate from the initial velocity to the final velocity. From the left-hand or the right-hand side, I'm going to integrate that from my initial time, which I'm going to call zero, to my final time. So for this part here, I'm taking my initial time is simply equal to zero, just to make my notation a little bit easier. <clears throat> Now, the left-hand side is simply going to be the integral of dv, which is simply v, evaluated from the final to the initial, which means the left-hand side is going to be v minus v initial. That's my left-hand side. Okay. The right-hand side, since their acceleration is equal to a constant by our caveat, that means it comes outside of the integral. So I have a integral from 0 to t dt. But well, what's the integral of dt? t evaluated from my bounds. So this just becomes simply a times t. It's actually a times t minus zero, but zero equals zero. So if I bring this term to the right-hand side, this thing finally becomes v is equal to v initial plus a times t. This is what's known as our first kinematic equation, number one. <clears throat> so <clears throat> before we move on, let's talk about what this thing actually tells me. What my first kinematic equation tells me is I can tell you exactly how fast this thing is going if I know how fast it was originally going, the acceleration, and what moment of time that I'm looking at. Okay. So what this thing tells me then is how fast is the object moving at any moment of time. So this is our first kinematic equation. So the first kinematic equation gives me the power to say this thing is moving at this speed or with this velocity at any moment. That's the power of this first kinematic equation. What's the second kinematic equation? Well, the second kinematic equation comes from the remembering that what? Velocity, by definition, is the same thing as dx dt. So all we're going to do is we're going to take our first kinematic equation here, rewrite the left-hand side as dx dt, and then do another integral. This is where the second one's going to come from. So let's go ahead and do that. So we now know v is equal to dx dt, which is equal to v naught plus a times t. So again, we're going to use our separation of variables. I'm going to multiply both sides by dt. So this thing is going to become dx is then equal to v initial dt plus a times t times dt. <clears throat> now again, all this thing is saying is that my amount that I move, so if this is my x-axis, this is my initial position of x0, and I move to this location of x plus dx, so that this is a small amount of dx. If I want to know the total distance I move from here to this location of x, again, all we're going to do is simply sum together all of these small different dx's, which means, again, we're going to do an integral. So I'm going to integrate this from the initial position, x0 to x final, and then integrate this side from 0 to t, and then this from 0 to t. Okay. So we're just going to simply sum all these guys together. Left-hand side, again, if I take an integral of dx, integral of dx is simply x, so this becomes x minus x initial is then equal to v0 is a constant. All this means is that this is how fast it was moving at the initial time. So again, I can pull that side out of the integral. So this becomes the initial integral 0 to t dt. Again, acceleration is a constant, so I can pull that out. This becomes a integral from 0 to t of t dt. Okay. This thing then becomes v initial times t plus. Anybody know what the integral of t dt is? 1 half t squared. 
Good. So this becomes plus one half a t squared. Good. Now let's move x zero to the other side. So finally, this becomes x is equal to x initial plus v initial times t plus one half a t squared. This is kinematic equation number two. So <clears throat> what does kinematic equation number two tell me? Kinematic equation number two tells me, well, I can now tell you where it is at any moment of time. So this tells me where the object is at any moment in time. So now between the first equation and the second equation, the first one again tells me how fast or what's the velocity at any moment of time. The second one now tells me where it is at any moment of time. Again, given the initial position, the initial velocity and the acceleration. Now, we don't have time to do the third one. We'll do the third one Wednesday to complete our three kinematic equations and we'll talk a whole bunch about these things. Now, for those of you who aren't in Calc 1 yet or are in Calc 1 but haven't gotten anywhere near integrals, don't worry too much about how I did all these integrals. The only thing I want you to understand is to know what each one of those two equations are telling you. So the only thing you care about is V is equal to V or V is equal to V naught plus A times T and X is equal to X naught plus V naught times T plus one half AT squared. Those are the only two things I want you to understand at this stage and what they tell you. Okay. So again, Wednesday we'll do the third one and then we'll talk about what each one of these things mean and then we'll do a whole bunch of examples on how we actually use these things in a given problem. Okay. So we'll do a bunch of demonstrations with those. So <clears throat> like I said, there's one more kinematic equation. It turns out that it's actually a combination of those two put together, but we're gonna do it slightly different ways. Okay. So uh, any questions anybody have at this stage? Do we have a lab later today? We do, yes. So today we'll have our first in-person lab today. Yes, 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 yes. For me, I get to do two back-to-back -back labs, so it'll be great. <laughs> All right, so if there's no more questions, then I'll see everybody on Wednesday or some of you this afternoon. Have a good one. You too. See you, Brian.